Okay, guys, so let's finish this up as quickly as we can, because I don't want to spend too much time on political economy since you're not going to get assessed on it. But uh, I do want to talk a little bit about 419 scams. So 419 scams um, are specific to the Nigerian legal code, um, but you're probably more familiar with them being called sometimes Nigerian email scams, the Nigerian prince scam. Um, first of all, for of all like what these usually are are they're, they're fishing expeditions right um fishing with a ph so what usually happens is you get a kind of creepy email in your email inbox that says hey um i'm in some sort of financial difficulty i have all of this money locked up but i need your bank account to transfer it to so that i can get access to it and once you do this i will let you have a portion of the money and essentially of course what they're trying to do is gain access to your financial institution right? Um, so these are really common sort of financial scams, and they're not unique to Nigeria. In fact, most 419 scams actually originate out of the United States, with a second highlight area of origination being Russia. However, <clears throat> They're associated with Nigeria in, partial, in part because Nigeria has lax rule of law, very, very weak financial enforcement. And so once things get transferred over to Nigerian like banks, it's hard to get the money back. So they kind of have this reputation for having a lot of these scams being run out of Nigeria. And the portion of criminal law that deals with those sort of financial crimes is called the is, is Section 419 of the Legal Code. So that's why that's associated with Nigeria. But um, there have been attempts to try and deal with corruption with all of these sort of um, issues of lax enforcement. Um, in 2013, 2003, um, they attempted to reform some of these economic problems um, by creating the National Economic Empowerment and Development Strategies, NEEDS. NEEDS was a program, is a program that is supposed to provide audits of governmental agencies to track where the money is going. So you don't have that issue of $8 billion being associated or being assigned to the production of steel and then it just like disappearing into the ether. Instead, this is supposed to make it clear where the money goes. Um, and the results are available to the public. Now, this has been carried out, but the fact is, is that it only really matters if you actually enforce the law after the public knows that there are problems. And so while there have been audits, sometimes the results of the audits don't necessarily mean anything. Um, you say, yeah, money went missing, and then there's a big, so what? Um, so you also have the creation of bodies like the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, and this group in particular focuses on theft, money laundering, and also 419 crimes. Um, so Nigeria is making attempts to try and tighten up its financial crimes and economic sort of loopholes, um, but this is going to require a high degree of state capacity that, frankly, Nigeria does, doesn't have right now. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is Nigeria's informal economy. So Nigeria has a massive informal economy. Remember, the informal economy is sometimes referred to as the black market, but not all things that are traded on the inf through the informal economy are necessarily illegal or even bad. About 80% of the Nigerian workforce is involved in the informal economy. Lots of people have legitimate jobs, and then they also have jobs that are off the books. Um, often people participate in the informal economy by selling pirated goods, um, things like you know DVDs of lo of uh, Disney movies that have been ripped off of you know some sort of like download site. Um, this is made possible because Nigeria has really weak rule of law. Generally speaking, this is a problem for the state because without the ability to tax these like these interactions, um, people selling um, handbags or selling shoes or clothing or something without having a small business license or paying any taxes to the state, that's revenue that the state could use to move away from its resource curse um, that it, it's not getting access to. So that's a big problem for the state right now. We think that the informal economy in Nigeria is about two-thirds of the legitimate size of the economy in Nigeria. So if we look at the GDP of Nigeria, if we take 67% of that and add it on again, we think that's actually how big the Nigerian economy is. But two-thirds of that, like that, um, that we're adding on there, that's not taxed. That's not providing any revenue to the state. It's not benefiting the public as a whole. It only 
benefits individuals, which that's good in and of itself. But this is actually where we see that really strong connection to China, because what tends to happen is people are largely distributing goods that are knockoffs or counterfeits or are not coming in through like registered means. And one major party that is playing into this is China. So there are whole communities of people from West Africa who live in uh, Guangzhou in the southern portion of China. It's a major trade port. And they that what they do is they take um, knockoff goods that are produced in China um, and then they ship them around to Africa, in particular to Nigeria, um, where then they are distributed throughout West Africa. Um, so these are really strong connections between China and Nigeria through these sort of informal economic ties. The last thing that I want to talk today about is Nigeria's direct connection to microfinance and microcredit. So we already talked about microfinance and microcredit as a whole um, in terms of development, but I do want to talk about what's up in Nigeria. So we've already discussed what microcredit is, but Microfinance in general is what we really want to talk about in terms of Nigeria. In Nigeria, only about 35% of the population have access to formal financial institutions. Like only 35% of the population have like banks near them. And that becomes really problematic because like online banking has only really just now developed to a point where people can use it effectively. Um, and unless you have a cell phone, um, online banking is going to be out of reach for you. So if you live in a town in the north or a town in the Niger Delta that is really rural and doesn't have a bank and no ATM, then it becomes very difficult for you to do things like take out a loan to start a business or to get financial assistance when you're in dire straits. So <clears throat> That's a big problem. However, Nigeria does have a number of microfinance, microcredit, and interesting other financial institutions that do provide some sort of economic stability to people who wouldn't otherwise have them. And in one particular case, we can look at um, these different financial institutions like savings clubs. So in Nigeria, savings clubs um, in some communities are called SOSO. And essentially what they are is they're groups of people people, usually women, who gather together and they decide that they're going to put aside a certain amount of money every week. And then what they do is every week they meet and they pay in the amount of money that's been agreed upon um, and they count the money out publicly. Um, they total it all up. And then every month or every six weeks or however often the, the SOSU has agreed that they'll do this, what they do is one person in the group gets all the money that has been collected during the collection period. And the idea is that the collection pot rotates through the community. And so if everybody's kicking in 50 cents a week um, and at the end of six weeks you get all of the money in the pot, what it does is it it encourages you to stick it out, to continue your contribution, because eventually it's going to be your turn to get that money. And then you can do something like, you know, put a new roof on your house. You might be able to um, put money aside to build an addition, to buy a loom, all sorts of stuff like that. <clears throat> So if we include savings clubs, then the financial institution access in Nigeria jumps to about 54% of the population. Still, that's very, very low. And microfinance, microcredit, and these savings clubs, they are better than nothing. But they don't really show us a lot of evidence of making the jump between like small businesses that keep a family afloat into firms that can help benefit a larger community. So like it might be good for like keeping your side hustle af afloat, but it's not creating economies of scales. And so essentially what we see are families falling into the middle income trap where yes, like countries experience some growth moving out of abject poverty, but they're not moving at the speed to be able to catch up with sort of developed nations around the globe. So this right here is a depiction of a Soso in northern Nigeria. Um, this is a savings club. You'll notice that these women, um, they've all met. The people in the circle are members. Um, other people are maybe family members waiting for them to finish up. Um, you see the woman in the center has the ledger book. Um, she's been elected by her community to keep track of the records. Everybody pays in their amount of money for the week. Um, the money goes into the bowl. Then they uh, they 
they count it all up, they put it in the lockbox that the woman has under the ledger, um, and then that money goes home with that woman for the week, and it comes back with her at the week, so that there's sort of like a chain <laughs> of responsibility, um, where everybody knows where the money's been, and how much money should be in there. And if it's not, then you have some accountability on a, on a sort of a, a, a group-wide basis. So these things are most effective when they're done by communities of their own volition, um, and when they're done uh, largely without input from outside groups. So like you'll notice here that it's all women. Um, often so-so are gender specific, like you will not allow men to join a so-so um, or men will have to have their own. Um, but this is the idea is to give some women some financial independence here. So there you go. That's a very, very quick overview of major economic issues that are at play in Nigeria today. Um, the next thing you're going to do for me is download the comparative chart. And I want you to go back over your notes for the whole year. And I would like you to work through it because tomorrow you're going to take a practice multiple choice assessment to help you kind of review this material. So take care, guys, and I will see you soon.